good morning, everybody. Um, I think I have the, the you know, perhaps a dubious distinction of being the first speaker today, but I think we're starting off from a, a good place because I'm not going to ask you to wrap your head around any like crazy new math or novel concepts or anything like this is we're not straying too much uh, from Ida, which is familiar waters for, for most of you, I assume. Um, so briefly, uh, I'm going to go through a little bit about who I am, what problem I'm trying to solve with this plugin, um, what it does, how it works, and there's going to be a demo at the end. Um, so very briefly, um, my name is Adam Schwalm. I work for a company called Dynetics uh, in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, I do a lot of reverse engineering predominantly with embedded systems with a, a team of guys, some of whom are also here. So Ida is a, a really powerful tool. You know, it's widely used in our industry. Um, why would I want to take information out of it? Doesn't Ida just kind of do everything that we need it to do? Well, part of the problem here is that embedded devices can often be very difficult to connect to remotely. So if you want to do debugging with all of the information that you've obtained by reverse engineering something in Ida, this can be a, a difficult task. Um, and even some of these platforms that are hard to connect to may still support onboard software debuggers. And I'll have an example in the next slide. And even leaving aside the whole embedded space, um, there are a fair number of tools that provide other interesting capabilities like reverse debugging that are not uh, present in Ida. So um, I'll talk towards the end of the talk about some of those other things that I think are, are uh, interesting uh, potential use cases. And a part of this talk is really going to be a call out to the community to things that, that you can think of to do with this tool. Once I've demoed it, you might have some ideas that I didn't think of. So QNX is a good use case here. Um, for the unfamiliar, a QNX is a real-time operating system. Um, it, it's pretty full featured. It has a scheduler and it loads L files. And, and so it, it's the user interface is similar to Linux in some respects. Um, and they provide a fork or a variant of GDB uh, that you could use to debug things on board, which would be awesome. Uh, and it seems like you'd be able to just connect to IDA remotely, except sometimes you don't have IP interfaces, and sometimes they, the GDB fork maintained by QNX has a different protocol for remote debugging, so you'd have to like get the sources and patch that back in. And so when I encountered this, I was like, well, I'll just export the info from IDA, and I'll pull it over to, you know, across the, like a serial link, and I'll debug on the device, and it'll be easy. And it wasn't easy because there is no thing that does that yet until now. So I was surprised. I, I don't think this is a, a super complicated tool. Conceptually, it's pretty straightforward, but um, I, I think it fills a, a, a gap that has existed in the, the IDA uh, plugin setup. So when, when I talk about I'm going to export the info from IDA, right, I, I, there's got to be some kind of format for that, and it needs to be a format that's widely understood and used by a variety of tools to make this actually helpful, right? Clearly, I could just dump everything to text, but nothing would understand it, so what would be the point? Um, there are a few options here. Uh, Stabs is one that was fairly widely used, and still is to some degree, um, but it's super old. It just sticks everything in the symbol table, so you get these big crazy strings in the symbol table. And while it is technically standardized, everyone's kind of got their own weird forks of it and other extensions into Stabs, and this makes it difficult to write something that actually works across a variety of tools. Dwarf is the debug format that you're probably using, even if you don't know it, if you're, if you're on Linux. So if you're building anything with GCC or Clang or I think Go and Rust and most tools on the Linux kind of compiled, you know, compiled language side of things are using Dwarf debug information. Um, it's a binary format also, so that helps if you're pushing things over like 9600 baud and you need to worry about size to save time. Um, Windows obviously has their own thing with their PDB files. Uh, this is not super well documented and to my knowledge there's not really a huge effort to like reverse engineer and document that, but interestingly there is a GitHub, uh, there's a, a repo on the Microsoft GitHub that actually has like, it's like a stub for where they're at some point going to put the docs for PDB. So uh, it, it didn't seem wise to invest a bunch of time in reversing it, only to have them a month later come out and say, here are our official internal docs for how it works. So um, when, and also such a thing would only be really useful on Windows, which wouldn't help me too much. Cough and others have their own debug formats, but they're not very widely used. Um, so Dwarf seems like the, the choice here because it is very widely used presently and will only be more widely used in the future. To my knowledge, there's no, you know, there's no up-and-comer that's going to come replace it. It looks like it's going to be around for a long time. So Ida plugin is a Dwarf export. Uh, so what this thing does is you are reverse engineering something in Ida Pro, whatever it is, uh, as long as it's an ELF file, you can... Uh, from this plugin, produce an L file that has attached dwarf debug information that you can use in most debuggers, and we'll, we'll, we'll get through uh, some, but you, you can use in a variety of tools, and it has all of your 
you know, function names and local variables and type information and all that niceness. Um, so you can use this to, to do uh, debugging on board some device. So with like the QNX use case, it's pretty straightforward to just export a binary with detached debug information, push it over a wire, and then debug on whatever device it is that you're, that you're working with. So that's all well and good, right? I can say, well, hey, I can take debug info out of IDA, and there's some interesting stuff you can do with it, but I've got half an hour, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how it works. Um, and, and as I said, there's a, a fairly, there's a few things that we need to pull out, right? For the architectures where a decompiler exists, we need to pull the decompiled source out so that we can get our cool like line numbers and you can step through things. Uh, we need to create an association between line numbers and addresses so that we can have like we can step in semantically meaningful units because we want to do more than just step I. Um, and we need to pull out global and local variable locations so that you can ask uh, whatever debug you're using or whatever you're using needs to know what variables exist within the current frame uh, and we need to pull out type information so that you can see all of the nice members and things and you can access members of structs and all that jazz. So this is going to be uh, uh, remedial for most of you, but uh, uh, very briefly decompilation, right, in a very hand wavy way works as uh, you, you know, disassemble something, uh, Ida pulls it out into its internal representation, which is not really like publicly accessible through the API, but there is uh, an abstract syntax tree which is publicly accessible through the API and this will be helpful to us in creating this semantically meaningful like this association between lines and addresses that we need um, and then IDA represents the abstract syntax tree in this this uh, nice way that you can read it as kind of C-ish uh, almost C. So we can access the abstract syntax tree which is this collection of, of nodes right very easily this is just a little Python script that does it and gives you the address for each uh, node in the AST. So here we can see, uh, you know, the, the, that decompiled program has, there's a block, and inside the block there's a call, and the call has, uh, you know, it's a call to printf with the arguments percent %d and 10, and there's a return, and it returns zero, right? You can see how it kind of goes through this tree, right? Abstract syntax tree. This is familiar to you if you've worked with compilers to, you know, any degree. I expect many of you are more familiar with this than I am. So um, this is a slightly more complicated pro uh, function from a program that I've forgotten what it was. Uh, on the right is a fraction of the ast because it goes on and on and on. Um, but we can see how like the first uh, line here maps to uh, this, these first three lines in the abstract syntax tree. So this is an assignment, if you can see it. Yeah, so this is an assignment. Uh, you can see it's an assignment expression. It takes uh, two kind of arguments. Uh, so we're assigning A3 to V3. And unsurprisingly, those all map to the same address, right? 404831, which should come as no surprise because under the hood, this is probably just like a move instruction. Um, but we can do this then for every line, we can map it to a particular address associated with some uh, node in the abstract syntax tree. And there's some kind of trickery here where you really need the lowest address associated with any subtree mapped to any line. Because if you have like a function that has a bunch of different function calls as arguments, then you need the breakpoint for the call to that function should be the first uh, argument function that is called. And that's not super important, but is a bit annoying to implement. Um, but so we can just go through in this way, and this is how we map uh, line numbers onto addresses in a kind of meaningful way. Local variables are more annoying than they ought to be. Um, so you would think that you can just get the like stack offset for a variable, and then you can emit dwarf information that says, hey, there's a variable named x. It's located you know, at this offset from the top of the stack or this offset from the bottom of the stack. Um, but unfortunately, while this works very well in IDA for the disassembler, if you're dealing with you know, just architectures that don't have the decompiler available, uh, everything works fine there. But if you're working with the decompiler, there are some problems with the IDA SDK, and it makes it difficult to get the location of stack-based variables. Um, so hopefully in the cool IDA 7 API revision that's coming up, if you've seen that uh, blog post, hopefully they will, they will fix this. Uh, also, we have to do register translations for register-based variables. Um, this has to be done on a per architecture basis. So if you've got, you know, if you're working on MIPS or something, you'll have to find the mapping of IDA registers to dwarf register numbers, uh, which can be kind of a pain to find, but is doable. There's usually some reference text that has it, or you can pull it out of the GDB source. Type information is also very straightforward. We're just mapping the uh, IDA T info T type uh, to basically into dwarf. So you're walking a tree and adding the, the, you know, if you have a structure and has a bunch of members, you're just adding the different types for each member and then the 
members of those types and so on and so forth. So, demo. Okay, so I'm not gonna, this is not a program of mind-bending complexity. Um, so this is a pretty straightforward little program. It, it clearly, it does some kind of, uh, there's some memory allocations and we do this kind of download and I've done a little bit of reversing on it. Um, it looks like it pulls a payload from this URL and it decrypts it with this is a key and this is an initialization vector and then it calls system on the output. So something you might see in some sort of uh, either some malicious program or maybe some kind of updater to, to some sort of firmware and we could uh, probably, given that this is actually just AES-256, we could just do the decryption ourselves because we have the key and the initialization vector, but let's suppose that this is some kind of custom encryption scheme and we can't do that, right? Or, I mean, we could, but it would be a pain, so it's easier to just uh, go through and, and debug the thing. Um, but yeah, you can see how there are there are types defined here. So I've got this thing called memory struct, which is used as part of the, the download mechanism. And there's uh, you know various function calls and things that are named. So this is all stuff that it would be nice to be able to pull out of IDA. And if I hop over to the terminal here, we can see this is just the example program. And this is the IDA file. And then that's the, because the file is open, uh, we have all the other IDA stuff. So I can hop over to plugins export dwarf debug information, and this is pretty much what the plugin looks like, not a whole ton of options at the moment, but you don't really need very many, it kind of just does the right thing. Um, so you can toggle on and off the decompiler, which is useful at least for testing for me, and possibly if you're not super interested in dealing with the, uh, the text source, you can just disable it. Um, and you can create a thing called, that I'm calling detached debug information, which is useful if you don't have an ELF file, if you have something that's just like a Windows PE file and you still want dwarf debug information, and you're gonna go through and then add it into some other format entirely, you can generate detached info, which just writes a bunch of files that contain only the dwarf debug info in them. So I can go and run this now, and it does the decompilation on all the functions and just glues the, uh, the output together, which produces a big C file, which we can now see here. Uh, so, no surprises here, this is just what you'd get if you went through every one of those guys and hit tab. Shockingly, it's using curl. But uh, you can see the decrypt function and the various callbacks and such. Okay, so that's not of any real value, but if we, and, and I can you know, demonstrate that uh, if I was to like read elf s example, right? The original program has no debug information, right? There's no section here called dot debug, um, but if we do the new one, the file that we just created, there is now a few sections, debug info line and a brief, which contain debug information, which we'll see useful here in a second. So now I can GDB, I can close IDA because it's not being used for anything. There's no sleight of hand here. IDA is uh, of no use whatsoever anymore. All right, and if I hop over here, this is GDB's TUI mode. If you use GDB and you don't know about TUI mode, you should learn about TUI mode because this is super useful. So uh, we can see now that we are, uh, we have the address line mapping in GDB working from, uh, you know, we've pulled it out of IDA, right? IDA is no longer involved, it's not doing anything. This is a, a standalone uh, program. I can set breakpoints on various functions. Let's run. Um, so this is the first line of, oh God. This is the first line of main that we were broken on. First executable line. Um, and I can step and, or what's next, so I don't walk into malloc. Um, but I can step and you can see now we're on this XOR right before the load of one into EDI and the call to malloc, right? So it looks like our, our line number association is doing the right thing. Um, I'm here, I'm about to load a zero into this offset from RBP, which is what you would expect if you're putting a zero into a stack local variable. Um, and we have uh, our local variables, I can say, Right, and so we can see local variables. They're mostly gibberish at the moment because we're presently doing initialization. Uh, but we can see if I, next again, I can print the chunk, right? And so this is a struct and it has some malloc memory which is not pres presently pointing to anything meaningful, but it has you know, this malloc and the size. And so you can, you're seeing down here at the bottom. Um, let's read this up a little bit. So, uh, the structure is being understood correctly and it's pulling out the, the values as you would expect. So uh, if we print the type 
of that variable. We have the structure, right? So we've pulled that out of IDA and GDB understands it correctly now and says, hey, there's this local variable, it's called chunk, its type is memory struct, here is the type, and you can access the various fields uh, and so on, which is great if you want to use GDB and you're on some remote device. So I'm going to skip down here after the decryption and I'm just going to put a breakpoint uh, on line 270 before the system call and then we're going to just get the output of the decrypted text, which is what we're after, so we know what's happening when we call system. So I'm going to BR on line 270 and continue. And okay, so we're here right before the call to system, uh, as you can see. And now I can print the value of decrypted text, right? And this shows you this is actually uh, not a bug. This is uh, GDB being overly correct uh, because I told it that the uh, decrypted text has a type of a K array of 128. So it prints the whole 128. It doesn't stop at the null terminator. Um, but I can cast that to a care pointer to make things easier to read. So uh, we see that actually what was happening is we were echoing do bad things and appending it to RX and RC, so this is probably some kind of malicious program, but it's a contrived example. But you get the idea. Um, this is you know, pretty, pretty full-featured uh, debug information. I mean, we're, we're, we're getting, well, if I can, if I'm not now trapped inside my VM. Come on, let me out. No. I'm just, this is, this is, this is the end. All right. I was going to do some, that, that, was the, that was the latest hack, where you press the win key to get out of the thing. Okay, so that's interesting. Um, that was really the, the use case that I had uh, for this tool. But I think there are a lot of other kind of potential uses here. Um, one thing that I really like to do that's, that's just a nicety is um, getting debug info for a bunch of shared libs and everything that's like linked together, and then you can just step through and you don't, you know, normally when you hit a shared lib, it kind of, execution goes off into the middle of nowhere and you're like, oh, now I've got to go pull up this shared lib and figure out what's going on. Um, and with this, you just have like full debug information. So you don't really care that, some, that execution went into a shared lib makes no difference to you. You have the relocations will work correctly and you'll have complete meaningful debug information for everything that you're, that you're working with. I've tested reverse debugging with RR, so you can actually, um, you know, you can go out and, and set breakpoints and, and RR basically just records the execution of a program. Uh, and then you can set breakpoints and step backwards because you're actually just, it's a kind of pre-recorded thing that you're stepping and unstepping through. So that's interesting if you have a program that you uh, want to be able to kind of unwind things and see exactly what was going on at a particular point. Green Hills also makes a, uh, a probe that uses JTAG and I think it can support some other protocols and their IDE called Multi, uh, which works with their debugger, um, can import dwarf debug information according to their docs. Um, I don't have a Green Hills license uh, for that stuff, so if anybody does and wants to test this, please let me know, because that would be really cool, right? If you could uh, pull firmware from something, uh, do some reverse engineering, export dwarf debug info, pull it into multi, and then you have your nice, like, you're actually doing hardware debugging, but you see you have, like, source and line number mappings and everything, and it, it's, it's very convenient. So I think that's an interesting possibility as well. Uh, as a sort of uh, hat trick, um, of course, because these are just binaries that have debug info, they work in things that use binaries with debug info, including things like Eclipse. Uh, so this is Eclipse with, uh, this is actually not the binary that we saw earlier. This is, I think, Lua that I generated debug info for. But you can see the same sort of thing where we have breakpoints and with the contents of the, uh, you know, the various the backtraces working and we have local variables and you can see the types and fields of those local variables and such, and that's great. And you can do the same thing with C Lion, which is the IDE from the JetBrains guys, and with Visual Studio's code, which is uh, another similar thing. And these guys are all based on GDB, or they have forks of GDB or something. So it's no surprise that, that if things work in GDB, they work in a bunch of other things as well. Interestingly, in the actual Visual Studios, um, there is a, a new kind of um, front end in their latest dev versions that uses a thing called Clang, which is you're probably many of you are probably familiar with, which is just a, a, a C, C++ compiler based on LLVM. Um, but you can use the Clang front end, and in the options it says you can generate full dwarf debug information, which implies to me that Visual Studios will now or in the future be able to uh, debug things with dwarf debug information, which we can produce now with this plugin. So uh, you may be able to relatively soon um, if I can get this working, this is Visual Studio, so I'm having difficulty, but uh, you may be able to debug malware in Visual Studios, right? Which I think people who work with malware would find interesting, if, if not useful. Um, so, of course, everything isn't, uh, you know, uh, sunshine. There are, there are limitations. Um, 
excluding the uh, Windows uh, stuff that I just talked about, the Visual Studio's possibility in the future, there's not much that I'm aware of that really uses Dwarf Debug Info on the Windows side, but that may just be ignorance uh, on my part. Um, limitations of the IDA SDK make things uh, annoying for local variables in certain contexts, um, but hopefully that will be fixed in the future. And register translations, as I said, have to be done on a per architecture basis. So if you have uh, some kind of esoteric architecture, then uh, you'll have to find that mapping. Uh, there are instructions uh, on the GitHub for uh, how to add additional architectures, and you really just have to edit like two functions. So it's not, it's not a huge deal. It's mostly just you got to find that mapping. Uh, oh, and also um, GDB8 broke a bunch of my stuff, but it released like a week ago, so I haven't bothered figuring out what's wrong. I suspect it might be a regression on their side, so. Uh, we'll see what happens there. But for the time being, don't use GDB8. And you probably are not using GDB8 unless you're running like Arch Linux or Gen2 or something. So uh, there's link. Uh, hopefully you can read it. Uh, GitHub.com, mail, schwalm, dwarf export. And there's a Google link uh, at the bottom. Um, my Twitter and GitHub are at ale schwalm. And you can email me uh, if you want to tell me that this is dumb or whatever. Um, I'm, I'm all ears. So uh, with that being said, oh, I've ended slightly early. So do you have any questions? There no. Hi. Thank you very much. Very interesting. I believe indeed there is a huge potential there. But <laughs> did you did you have a look at the file called dwarf.cfg because the mappings are actually there for the for the register? Okay, I figured it was somewhere in uh, in in GDB. Yeah. I, I I never quite. It was. I looked around a little bit and I found some of the mappings in Wine and so I was using those and I figured it was in GDB but I was actually pulling it up uh, before I got here but I was having internet connection problems so that, that's good to hear. So is that so that works on is it just like every architecture that is that GDB cross compiles to? No, 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 no. It's not. It's not a GDB file. It's an IDA. It's in the CFG directory. And the, oh, that makes sense because they can pull in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Obviously, of course, yeah. they have to have it. That's cool. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll add that then. I'll just pull them all in. That's great. And just a remark. Uh, I am not certain that what, to, what, what was annoying, annoying to you in the local variables domain there will be fixed for 7.0, but if you drop us a line on support, we may actually have some, you know, we may actually do something about it. So please let us know what is not working for you. I made a forum post. I was told that there's a, an internal uh, there's an internal variable that's not part of the public, publicly exposed API that you're supposed to add to stack offset. So I was hoping that you would just expose that in the public API, whatever that is. Okay, I see. All right. We'll have another look then. Thank you. But yeah, I, I mean, we can talk afterwards if. Sure. if uh, any other questions? Thank you. This tool is extremely interesting, and I'm excited to try and play. But this is more of a comment that also some of the microcontroller debuggers, um, like the Renaissance tools and Kyle and thing like that, things like that, also do support importing Dwarf. So that's where I am interested. I'm going to go and play with it and try for some of those other architectures as well. Yeah, that that was my my strong suspicion was that that was the case because I, I thought it, it it generally it's unlikely that someone's kind of invented their own debug format for something. So I think a lot of people are probably using Stabs or Dwarf. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm glad to hear that that you know that some of that stuff works because I, I don't have any I didn't have anything on hand to test uh, to test this with that was kind of in that space. Any other questions? No. All right, I'm gonna give the. The next guy time to set up, which will be probably nice.